Before we start the podcast, we wanted to let you know about West OS. If you're a teacher or pupil at a school in Scotland, then you now have access to hundreds of quality assured video lessons created by teachers to support your remote learning. You should be able to find West OS within the app library of Glow, where you can add the tile to your own personal launchpad. Click on the tile and you'll have immediate access to stream lessons in every area of the Scottish curriculum, with video lessons already available for biology at National 5, Higher and Advanced Higher. Now let's get on with the podcast. The first positive case of coronavirus was confirmed in Scotland on March the 1st, 2020. 19 days later, on Friday the 20th of March, schools across Scotland closed as the country went into a national lockdown to suppress the virus. They remained closed until last month, with pupils returning to full-time education by the 18th of August across the country. Throughout this global crisis, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has given daily news briefings and is often joined by the National Clinical Director, Professor Jason Leach. In this special edition of the Higher Biology podcast, I am joined by Professor Leach to learn about his journey from his own Higher Biology class to having responsibility for the health care of a nation. We will answer questions from pupils across Scotland about the introduction of face coverings in schools and tell you what you need to know to stay safe. So I'm Jason Leach, I'm the National Clinical Director of the Scottish Government. So pre-COVID, that meant I had a responsibility for quality and safety of the health system. And I looked after things like cancer care or patient safety or cardiac disease, stuff like that. And I'm also a bit of a systems and change guy. So I'm the guy who you might come to in the government to say, we've been trying to do, what will we say? We've been trying to do literacy in schools for years, banging our heads against the wall. Nothing's really changed. Is there anything in the science, not of literacy, but the science of change? how you might do that. So, I, so I've got a bit of a reputation as the change guy. And before that, very quickly, going backwards in time, I was a oral surgeon, which is head and neck surgery. So cancer of the mouth, trauma of the head and neck, wisdom teeth, that kind of thing. And then right before that, I was a dentist. And then before that, I was at Airdrie Academy, doing higher biology and higher English and higher maths and doing all of them equally badly. But I've ended up as the clinical director of the country. And what was your favourite subject at school? You know, probably maths. I, I, I uh, the the maths teachers. Uh, I think it was because I had to do less work because for some reason I could just do it. When I was in the English class, they actually made me think a bit more, and I actually had to because I, I was fundamentally lazy. Now I would call that a strategic learner, but actually it just meant I was lazy, and uh, didn't like too much effort. Hated languages because they actually required real content and you had to put your head down and study it so maths came pretty easy to me so maths and science was an obvious route and and then in it's a long time ago now 1986 I started doing dentistry and believe it or not I've actually managed to track down your own former higher biology teacher Mr Gravel and I've actually asked I've actually asked him for a bit of a report card on Professor Leach Jim Gravel I think was he James Gravel yeah, Jim Gravel. And so I got in touch with him and asked him if, 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 he, if he remembers you and if he could send me a little bit of a report card. So I've actually got a little snippet of something that he wanted to pass on for you. That's hilarious. Professor Leach, or Jason, as I would have known him then, was in my higher biology class more than 30 years ago. I regularly watch his TV briefings during this crisis, proud that one of our former Airdrie Academy pupils is doing this vital work for the country. Today's pupils can be inspired by him to know that they too can make an important contribution in the future. And he didn't mention the fact you were lazy once. Isn't that absolutely lovely? What a lovely thing to do. I, I, can, rem- I can remember him vividly. I can remember him. It was probably a little more traditional than it is now. Teacher at the front, everybody in, everybody in rows of desks in a, in a science block that was a little bit distant from Airdrie Academy's main teaching block. I did 
physics in there on sitting on and it was up on science stools and uh, he was a ter- he was a terrific teacher a bit, a bit like you just described Paul about storytelling bringing the subject to life rather than rather than a, a book at a time I do remember going through a biology textbook I do remember those days of we're now on chapter four but he was he, he brought the subject alive I remember him well uh, obviously, one of the one of the changes that's come into schools recently uh, has almost taken us back to to that situation of the teacher at the front, two meters away, um, and everybody facing the front. So, uh, I, possibly he was ahead of his time. He may well have been. How do you go though from from being Jason sitting in Mister Gravel's biology classroom to becoming Professor Leach standing next to the first minister? I have absolutely no idea. You 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 take opportunity. You don't plan too much. You you do what you love, and you work hard, and and, and you you're kind on the way up. Those would be my fundamental values. That doesn't work for everybody. I I, I come from a I come from a family of my father was a coal miner, my mother was an office worker. They they gave me every encouragement and opportunity, I, and I I took those opportunities as they arose, and I've tried to do that in a way where I've always had a group of pals, a peer group. That's not always been straightforward. Airdrie, Airdrie Academy was a tough old place in the early 1980s, particularly for a, a smart, fat guy. So it was, it, was a, it was a little bit, it had moments where I wasn't enjoying it. But actually, then when you move to university or college or a workplace, you, you gather around people who you're pals with and you stick with them. I, I still go out every second Wednesday so it's been a little bit different recently. Every second Wednesday, I still go out with pals that I made during my dentistry course 30 years ago. So we still go for dinner. I think I think peer group friends, whether that's school school friends or uni friends or college friends, is hugely important. And then you, you've got to take opportunities as they arise. So I got the opportunity to go to America, my wife and I, in 2005 to spend a year doing a fellowship, doing some public health. So you've got, to, you've got to seek and take those opportunities when they arise. They're not going to come looking for you. So you, you've, you've, got to, you've got to make some of your own running. And, and the only other thing I would say, and it sounds such a cliche, is you have actually got to work hard. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't just come your way. You've, you've got to, if you want to do, if you want to be a maths guy or a coder or you want to be a gymnast, or it's not any different. You've, you've got to put, put in the work to put yourself ahead of what will be extensive competition. So work hard and be nice is my value system. And I guess you must have learned a lot of lessons along the way. Would there be any other advice that you would give young people at school that are thinking about heading out in those careers other than obviously getting their head down and working hard? So that, so, so when I say working hard, I don't mean an isolation of a social life or being. So you've got to be broad. Most people who who end up doing whether they become engineers or they become math teachers or they become doctors or lawyers or nurses, they, they've usually had a pretty rounded experience. So they may have played sport. They might have played an instrument. I was hopeless at sport. I wasn't very good at playing musical instruments, but I sang in a choir. I, I mean, it, it, whatever, whatever floats your boat. You want, to, you want to ride a canoe, then ride a canoe. If you want to go on outdoor events, then do that. If you want to play the clarinet, then play the clarinet. But at the same time, don't take your eye off the biology, the math, the English. That's going to be your ticket, part of your ticket, to to get to where you want to go. But I think probably, Paul, since you and maybe you're younger than me, but since I was a boy, the ticket has got a little bit more complicated. So the ticket rightly needs to be academic. And you, you should you should if you want to do X, you should pass Y. But I think there's more to it than that now. I think I think most employers want people who can speak out loud, who are nice, who know how to dress properly for the occasion, who know how to be kind to other people, know how to help other people succeed. So I think they want you to prove that. And that might be because you've been in the Girls' Brigade, or it might be because you've been on a Duke of Edinburgh. It might be because you've helped your granny and cared for her for years. I, I, I mean, it can vary from person to person. But I think they want, I think most employers want breadth of experience as well as academia. And of course, one of your current employers um, is, of course, the Scottish Government. What's it been like working so closely with the First Minister? Uh, it's interesting. So the, 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 what you see 
in the public eye is pretty much what it's like. There aren't there aren't many secrets. The the first minister and the cabinet actually they're hugely smart, irrespective of politics. They're very clever. They they take information in very quickly. They don't mess around. If, if that makes sense, there's not a lot of time for small talk. There is a little bit of time for small talk, but not a lot. So so they want to get to decisions really quickly. Imagine sitting in that seat just now where you have everything that you always have, the budget and the politics and the parliament and education and health and all of that. And then somebody comes along in kind of February, March and says, just in case you weren't busy enough, there's a global pandemic that's going to infect 30 million people and going to kill a million of them. So, so I'm not sure you'd want to be sitting in that seat when that message comes along. So I am I'm very impressed with uh, almost all of the politicians I've met, both in power and in opposition. The People won't believe this, but most of them want to do the right thing. They are in it for good reason. Now, there's layers of politics on top of that, and power, and who's going to win, and all that. And I, I stay out of that bit of the puzzle. But democracy is what we have, rightly, and we should make the best of it, and let the decision makers make the decision. So I, it I was going to say it's it's rarely fun. That's not fair. It, it is it is sometimes fun. It's good having a purpose. It's very interesting being in these rooms and I, that I never thought I'd be in. And it's a pretty small room now of people who are making these choices and giving the advice to the decision makers like the, the, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. But I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. The motives are, are genuinely to do the best for people, particularly at a time like this. I mean, if you look at the New Zealand Prime Minister or the, the people who run France or the people who run Somalia, I mean, it, 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 everybody's struggling. There's 194 countries in the world and and everybody is struggling with what, what the right thing to do here is. And Scotland's no different. Scotland's got, I would, of course, say good advisors. We've got good science. We've got good uh, universities helping us. But the decision makers are sitting in pretty lonely seats to decide what businesses can open, what's the economic inc- implications of what they do, and what are the health implications of what they do. How do you come to those decisions in that room, especially at the moment, under such pressure? So there's a formal version of that, Paul, and an informal version. The formal version is, uh, and this this is actually what happens, we, we look at every decision through four lenses. So imagine a, imagine a pair of binoculars with four lenses in it. And lens number one, is COVID. What, how much harm is there from COVID? Lens number two is how much harm is there in the health and care system because of what you do? So let's say that increases the cancer waiting time, or it increases the time you wait in A&E or for your hip replacement, or mental health. Harm number three is society harm, and that's led by the Chief Social Policy Advisor for Scotland, who works alongside us as a separate advisor. And that's things like loneliness, or what does it mean to lock down your society? What does it mean to close the schools for five months? And that's a different set of harms from the direct illness harm. And then harm number four is the economic harm, led by the chief economist for Scotland, a guy called Gary Gillespie, who you won't have seen on the TV, very bright economist, who then helps us understand, if you close hospitality, this is what it does to employment. If you close X, Y, or Z, This is what it does to your gross domestic product for your country. And then the decision makers, the horrible seat, is they then get all of that advice from me, from the the other advisors, and they have to make really, really tough choices on that route map out. Then there's informal occasions. So, of course, there are conversations in the corridor or in boardrooms or uh, waiting to go into the briefing where we might say, what, we're, we're a bit worried about Glasgow. What do you think we should do? Do you think we should get somebody to commission a bit of research? Or do you think we should go and talk to the local authorities? So, of course, there are relational conversations at the same time. And, of course, many of those decisions impact young people directly. What, what would you say to them about life at the minute and how those decisions are impacting their life? Yeah, there's, there isn't a piece of society untouched by this. The first thing I would say is that if your life feels normal, you've misunderstood. So, so, it, so if you're behaving or you feel as though it's last November, then you haven't understood the nature of what we're dealing with here. Young people in the main have a mild course of disease if they catch this virus. So so most young people would survive and, and many wouldn't even know they've had it. 
but they can spread it to others and they can spread it in particular to vulnerable others. So family, loved ones, people they've never met or their own granny and grandpa. So you've got to be careful. And young people's views are taken into account in those conversations that we have across society. One of the reasons why we open schools again is we don't like having them shut, not just for learning, but for community spirit, for education about team working, for getting to see your pals, for the football club, for the digital club, whatever. whatever. We, we, we know how important schools and uh, colleges in particular are to both the present and the future of our society. So young people in the main have played a blinder. I've done quite a lot with young Scott over this period. All the questions have been great. People, I think, have followed the rules in general. I, I don't want to be the one who uh, blames young people for anything. There are some young people who don't follow the rules, but there are some older people who don't follow the rules too. And my message to all of them is exactly the same. It will take us much longer to get out of this and the harm will be much higher if we don't follow the guidance and do that together. And that, if you're 75 or 15, that, that message is exactly the same. Let's hear from Shelley Queen from the digital content team at Young Scott, who's got a little bit more information on where you can find out information about coronavirus and mental health. So any young person who wants to find out a bit more information about coronavirus, including what phase we're in, what restrictions are in place, things like how to wear a face cover in a school, as well as lots of other tips on how to protect yourself and other people around you, they can go to young.scot forward slash coronavirus. That site also includes information about things like work, relationships and support for young carers too during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and you can also follow us on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook and Twitter. We're basically everywhere um, and we update those uh, platforms very regularly with all the, the latest information. That's good to know. I guess you're right. Some young people may be feeling a little anxious or stressed as a result of coronavirus. Where can they go to find specific information and support? Yeah, so it's it's completely understandable to feel sort of like anxious or stressed out because of the current events. I mean, we're all trying to to manage pretty much sort of unprecedented times, as everyone keeps saying. But um, as well as kind of talking to somebody that they trust about how they're feeling, be it a parent or carer, a friend, a teacher or a GP, you can also take a look at the young.scot forward slash I feel page. That has a lot of useful information about how to look after your mental health and emotional well-being. On there, you'll also um, find some conversations that we've had with a number of different experts on things like sleep, body image, what happens if you speak to um, Childline, for example. We've got loads and loads of topics on there. So that's a really good place to go if they're feeling a little bit stressed out. Yeah, that sounds like a great resource. And and within the Young Scott website, people, young people can now claim reward points for each episode of this podcast that they listen to by using the rewards code that's in the episode description. What are these reward points and why should young people claim them? Yeah, so it's super exciting that we've got Young Scott Rewards Points on this podcast now. Um, so for those people who aren't aware, Young Scott Rewards Points are part of our Young Scott membership offer. Um, so that's a website where you can complete certain tasks, things like listening to this podcast, volunteering, filling out surveys, other stuff like that. And once you do those tasks, you get points. Those points can then be exchanged for prizes or experiences. So in the past, we've given away things like MacBooks and Amazon vouchers. We've also done things like behind the scenes tours at places like STV or the Edinburgh festivals. So it's well worth signing up for. Um, if you are interested in becoming a Young Scott member, all you need to do is go to young.scot forward slash membership and get all signed up. As Shelley said, there's lots of information on coronavirus and how to stay safe on the Young Scott website. And if you are feeling anxious or stressed about coronavirus or any other aspect of life, then you can find information and advice on their site about mental health. But it's always helpful to talk to someone you can trust, like a parent, carer or teacher. Schools are of course now back, and I think we're all grateful to be back in classrooms again, even although there are restrictions in place. We've had lots of questions come in from across the country, specifically about face coverings in school in general. So hopefully we can answer some of those now. Liam from Peebles High asks, why face coverings 
have only been introduced from the 31st of August, two weeks after the schools reopened. Has there been any new evidence? It's a, this is a good question, and it, it takes us into not just face coverings, but all the elements of this virus. So there is an inconsistency sometimes with what we said in March or what we said in April, and then I imagine if you replay this in November, the rules will have changed again. Unless you only interview each of us once, the guidance and rules are, are inevitably going to change. I, I've been on a number of radio shows where they've played me back a clip of basically me saying the opposite of what I'm now seeing. There's a number of reasons for that. The, the first is, of course, that we learn more all the time. The science changes. The virus it becomes more known by the scientists, so we know how it spreads now. The testing is better. We've got more testing available. The other thing is that we learn from experience. We learn as you open stuff what happens. You can't really model opening all the shopping malls. But when you open the shopping malls, you can kind of see what happens. You can see if the virus spreads or how people move around. Do the one-way systems work? And schools is no different from that. The initial advice from the Education Recovery Group, which is our scientific education group, was that we hoped that face coverings wouldn't be required. The, the science around face coverings has changed over the last few months from the WHO, from other countries and their experience. And we decided there's no risk-free route here. There's no safe route out of a pandemic. You've got to take risk. We decided that the balance of risks suggested that face coverings in communal areas, when, when possible, was the right balance. So you could say face coverings 100% of the time, everybody, <coughs> transport, classrooms, the whole lot. That would be safer. Or do you take some kind of risk, you balance the risk and say, no face coverings ever, none at all. That's the other extreme. So these, these are really difficult uh, choices you make. So we chose in consultation with unions and teachers and pupils and others to say, right, let's, let's do the riskiest time. And the riskiest time is communal areas when people are moving around, when people are too close together. Let's do face coverings there. But when we're in the classroom and we're learning and it's easier to look at each other, let's, let's not have face coverings there. That might change, Paul, but that's, that's the present risk position we're willing to take. So hopefully that answers Liam's question. Anna in S4 asks, we are closer together in classrooms than in some communal areas, so why not wear them in classrooms? So that's exactly the same question, just pitched in a different way, really. So we, we have to take risk to open Zara, never mind open schools. So, so th I preferred March, if I'm honest. The public health guy liked everybody locked in their houses. It's much easier for me. I can stand up at the podium every day and say, stay at home and sit back down again. It wasn't a very difficult message. This is a much more difficult message, but we've got to get people back to school. There's 110,000 people in this country get free school meals at the weekend. School, schools are an essential construct for community and society. They are not just to teach you biology. They are for teaching you biology, but there's so much more than that. So it's very, very important that we get those building blocks of society back, whether that's pubs and restaurants, schools, places of worship, whatever they are. We've got to do them as safe as we can, but there is no 100% safe route. So that's why there are. it feels like sometimes there are choices in there that don't make entire sense. And I guess that, that's echoed again in a question from Belle in my own higher class at Hindland Secondary, who had asked, why do we need to wear masks in corridors between classes, but at lunchtime we can't wear them while we're eating in corridors if it's raining outside? And I guess that's, that's exactly the same, yeah, isn't it's it? it's the same. You, t you, you, take, you take risk now. Well, let's, let's go an extreme version. So if, so if I asked you to go to, into an intensive care unit that was full of COVID patients tomorrow, you'd say, whoa, that, that feels a bit risky. Maybe I should wear uh, some protective equipment for that. I'll say, OK, why don't you wear a face covering? Just a, just a normal face covering from the house. No, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that sounds right. I think I need more than that. Well, you're right, because the risk of going into an intensive care unit with COVID patients is much higher than the risk of other places. But the, the, the risk decision is really, really difficult, unless you do the two extremes. One extreme, living on your own, stay in the house, lock the door, don't let anybody in, no risk. At the other end, high risk, intensive care, 10 patients with COVID, 
I'm looking for the full on body armor, the full mask. Everything in between is a judgment. And you've, you've got to use the best science you've got in consultation with the sector, education for your example, and make, make the right decisions for the whole population. And Eliza, from your own former school, Airdrie Academy, asks, "Do you she'll think she'll be smart? And she whatever, whatever, she'll be, she'll be a genius." It's a good question. She asks, "Do you think the NHS could cope if a virulent seasonal flu and second wave of COVID occur simultaneously?" Yeah, we're very worried about it. It's, a, it's an excellent question, Eliza. So we're worried because, and you can see already in the last few weeks where colds, rhinoviruses, have got mixed up with. COVID and how people find it difficult to distinguish between the two and you need to get tested and you've got the cold, all of that uh, carry on. And that's going to potentially get a little bit worse as we move into winter when we mix it up with flu, colds, what we call RSV, which is a kid's virus that young kids get in the main, and the winter. So we're going to be indoors, we're going to have the central heating on, we're going to have less ventilation, the virus is going to love it. So, so we are worried about those two things combining, the winter and the diseases. Now, there's a few things in our favour, so it's not all doom and gloom. The southern hemisphere, so Australia and New Zealand, they should have had the flu season already and there's not been much flu. So that's a good sign. That means the physical distancing, the hand washing is also helping with flu. We're also expanding our flu vaccination. So we're going to do a lot more flu vaccines. We're going to uh, vaccinate two and a half million people by December. So that's a huge undertaking, logistical for kids, for adults, for the vulnerable. So that's also going to help us. And we're hoping that the virus might help us. So the virus might change and become a little bit less virulent, might die a bit quicker, but there's no sign of that yet. Freya from People's High asks, if people who have asthma don't have to wear one, does that not mean they are at double risk? So if we if it's a place where we think face coverings are recommended or mandatory, then there's a reason for that. We've, we've decided that's a high risk area and you should wear them if you can. We haven't said asthmatics don't need to wear face coverings. We've said you should try them. If you find it really affecting your breathing, and it is unlikely it will, because they don't stop people breathing. So try a different type, maybe try a lighter one, try one of the disposable ones. You might not like it, but I haven't met many people that do like it. That's a different thing from not being able to wear it because you're ill. So most asthmatics can wear them completely safely and completely comfortably, and they like them just about as much as everybody else likes them. There are some exceptions to that. People with very severe disease, some people on the autistic spectrum disorder really don't like the the sensation, so it becomes impossible. So there are some exceptions, but a a medical exception is rare. And I would ask people just to have a go and and see how they get on. And if they can do it, then it would be a little bit safer. Jake from Beeslack Community High School would like to ask if the vents in some masks are effective and they also has a second question which I personally would like to know the answer to and that's if there's any way of stopping your glasses steaming up when wearing a mask. So that's a, that's a good surgeon question because th- those of us who have operated in theatres for hours and hours and hours with masks on have the absolute solution to that in a moment or two. So, so the... The ones with the, I don't know what he means by vents, he probably means the filters at the front. They're a bit rubbish, honestly. Unless you go right upstream and get the really posh ones that we use in intensive care and in hospital surgical environments. So the ones with the little round vents on the front, I wouldn't I wouldn't bother if I were you. I would go for the slightly cheaper normal ones. Uh, the, the, the surgical tip for glasses not steaming up, apart from getting ones that really fit well, so masks that really go across your nose. It's just a tiny bit of fairy liquid, just a tiny dab of fairy liquid on your fingers and rub your glasses with them. Not so that it smears all over them, but just so that it just so that it marks them a little bit. Dip them in water, let the water fall off, on you go, no steaming. A bit like goggles when you go swimming. Correct. Correct. That is my uh-huh. glasses top tip. That's what substance have done for years. That should definitely make the daily news briefing, I think. Um, another people asks, why do footballers get tested weekly, but pupils and teachers don't? 
Yeah, these are excellent questions. So the difference between sport and most of the rest of society is they are living in a bubble, a, a COVID bubble. Now, there's two types of COVID bubble. We need to, this takes a bit of explaining. There is a very, very secure bubble, and then there's a slightly less secure bubble. And we had to make choices again. So think of Formula One. So Formula One is thousands of people who travel the world and they go from Grand Prix to Grand Prix. They have a secure COVID bubble. You had to isolate for 14 days. You were tested on day 10. If you were negative, you got into the bubble on day 14, and you haven't been allowed to leave. If you leave, you can't get back in. You cannot visit the bubble. You cannot go to Tesco. You can't buy a toothbrush. You are in the bubble. And that bubble moves around the world in private jets and trucks, so they don't touch anybody else in society. So if you see the Sky News presenters, the Formula One presenters, the drivers, the journalists, everybody that you see is in the COVID secure bubble. So we know for certain COVID isn't in there. Does that make sense? So they're not seeing their family. They're not seeing their kids. They're not seeing their granny. If they leave, they've got to re-isolate for 14 days, get retested before they're allowed back in the bubble. That's really hard. So there's only a few sports that have done that. Formula One has done it. Golf has done it in the, in the high end. The PGA have done it. And a couple of other very, very elite sports have done it. The, the less secure bubble is what football has done, what rugby has done. We've given them advice to have as little contact with the outside world as you can. So no supermarkets. Try not to go out for a drink. Try not to go to hospitality. Don't meet the fans. And we're going to test you twice a week two days before each game, so that we can be sure when you meet the, the other team, you're COVID-free. We can't guarantee you're COVID-free because remember, that if it's not a completely secure bubble, there is a risk. But in the main, that has worked. We've had a few positives. We had a St. Midden positive. We had a couple of Aberdeen positives, as, as you know, uh, most people who follow the news will know well, and a few others. And, and today, there's some positives in the English team or some breaking of quarantine in the English team today. So, so those, those less secure bubbles are not quite as secure, but they're not going about their daily business like teachers are, like pupils in schools are. And that's why testing doesn't help us in education. How frustrating is it when, when some of these individuals that are in these bubbles maybe don't follow the advice and, and you know other people are maybe looking at that as an example? It's not without frustration, Paul, let's say. So it, it, it's a little disappointing. When, when you see people who have been given special privileges because they've been allowed back to work before other sectors uh, with special rules. And, but also, I kind of understand, I'm fed up with lockdown. Are you not? I mean, it's six months of it. Totally. So, so every, everybody wants back to normal. So I'm not, it's not some abstract concept that I think, why do people do this? I'm as fed up as everybody else. But I know that if we, if we breach it, we're going to go backwards, not forwards. And it's going to be longer rather than shorter. So short-term pain is going to get us out the other end. So it is frustrating when I see that. And, and we, I think football in particular has learned an important lesson over the last three or four weeks. Holly from BSAC Community High School asks, what type of masks are better, material or disposable? And I guess we, we kind of touched on that a little there's bit. Not ma- there's not a whole lot of difference, actually. What, one that fits snugly around you that's, that's comfortable enough. The disposable ones are good because you can clearly dispose of them, but they're not good for the climate. So there's a balance there about, so I've got both available to me. If I know, if it, the, I kind of use the disposable ones as a bit of an emergency. Like if I need suddenly to go to a garage that I wasn't expecting to have to go to or something, I might put on a disposable one quickly. But when I, when I uh, went to the rugby, for instance, I used a, a fabric one because I knew I was going to have it on for a, for a long period of time. Didn't have to take it on and off much. So, so I, I think probably have both available, but the and the the climate I'm beginning to see them lying about the place. People are people are getting them from beaches and stuff when they're being washed up from the water. That doesn't seem right. So I certainly don't want to make one crisis worth worse during this crisis. So I, I think probably fabric ones if you can do it. I guess that really links back to Jake's question and Holly's question. When it comes to masks, the masks are obviously. T- more for the protection of others rather than individually. So it really has to be a collective effort of everyone. It does. And that, that's why when, when, you, when you try and do it, you shouldn't 
don't 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 become the mask police. That's just that that way lies trouble. But but it, but if you can use your peer group to kind of gather everybody around it to try and think about how we could do it together, it is a collective effort. And people people should want to do it for each other and to protect each other. That doesn't mean I want you going around the third year and yelling at them because they've not got their face coverings on. That I, my wife's a teacher, and I can just imagine trouble all the way down that. Uh, I think I'll take that message as well as as well as the young people in. Um, I, I, and and really finally, we obviously face a, a kind of bumpy academic year ahead. There's so many elements of the whole crisis that that still remain unknown. Um, and and we can't ask you to predict the the future. But what advice would you have to young people? for the coming academic year? Yeah, so I, I think there's hope. I think there's quite a lot of hope, actually. I think that the, it, it's not going to get uh, any more difficult than it's been, I don't think. I mean, I think there might be rocks on the road and there might be ups and downs, so we might end up with some schools closed, some transmission in schools. We might end up even with whole sections of the country having to go back a bit and then forward again. I, I'm really hopeful that we won't have to do anything nationally Again, particularly to schools, I think we'll we'll close other things before we close schools. Some might be disappointed at that, of course, but I, I'm hoping we can keep education moving. I think you're going to have to be patient, pupils and staff, with the nature of that education, what it will look like. But I think some of the things we've learned about digital communication and Zoom and those those things will stay with us. I think some of them are for the better than 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 uh, in the past. But there's nothing to be that in in person, face to face, education or football team or whatever it is happens to be your thing that you do at school, whether it's the book club or the hockey class. The 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 bigger hope is that we will get out the other end of this. I mean, this isn't forever. Science will probably relatively soon get us better treatment. It will probably get us a vaccine, maybe in the first half of next year, and we'll get better testing. We'll get better ways of deciding if you are immune to the disease. We just we just don't know the answer to that yet. So I'm very hopeful that science, biology, in fact, will get us out the other end of, of what is a very, very challenging pandemic across the whole globe, and everybody is working to get that done. And of course, without that technology, um, we our young people wouldn't have access to people like yourself on the podcast and um, giving them that information. So a huge, huge thank you for all your time. You're welcome, and thank you very much for having me. I'd love to come back. Again, many thanks to Professor Leach for taking the time to speak to us and to our supporters, Education Scotland, Young Scott and Lecky Scotland. You can subscribe to the podcast on all mainstream platforms. But more importantly, please remember facts. Face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean your hands regularly, two metre distance and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms.